Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening here. Uh, my name is Sarah Harrison. I work for the International Federation of Red Cross Red Crescent Societies, um, and in that uh, function, I'm also the co-chair of the Interagency Standing Committee Reference Group on Mental Health and Psychosocial Support. And today, I'm going to talk to you um, and provide an introduction um, to the concept of mental health and psychosocial support, and in particular in uh, humanitarian or emergency uh, contexts. So what are the mental health and psychosocial needs of children? And we can break this down into two concepts, which I hope you are familiar with already. On the um, left-hand side, you can see that there's something called the well-being flower. And uh, this flower um, has petals on it. Uh, there are seven petals that you can see. And these petals represent a particular domain or area of well-being. And you can see that there are biological areas which relate to um, physical health. So if you are physically healthy in your body, you also have material domain aspects of well-being, which are in relation to your basic needs, your shelter, um, access to uh, food, uh, water, uh, sanitation facilities, um, clothing, non-food items as well. You also have social aspects of well-being, um, which is the ability to have friends, to form relationships um, with your peers, um, family members um, as well, and your broader community. There are also spiritual aspects of well-being, which are um, very important in many um, humanitarian contexts around the world. And this is spirituality, both in terms of a formal religion, um, or faith or in terms of a value system and view. And spirituality is important, particularly around issues to do with loss or grief, um, issues to do with mourning periods after somebody um, has died or after you've lost your house, perhaps uh, due to a natural disaster. And also um, celebrations of joy. Um, when a child is born in a family, um, christenings, for example, or initiation ceremonies, um, as well as uh, issues related to marriage or graduation and starting and ending school, for example. There are also cultural aspects of well-being, um, which are related to cultural activities in society, the traditions that might be done, the jokes that are told um, between community members, um, the particular traditions, the celebration days, how celebrations are, are taking place, um, as well as spaces for cultural events, such as community centres um, or marketplaces. There are also mental aspects of well-being, which are related to cognition, um, which is to do with your brain, and um, its healthy development um, as well. Uh, and it also includes mental health conditions and other disabilities. For example, um, people living with epilepsy or children with uh, intellectual disability or living with an autism spectrum condition. And then finally, there are also emotional aspects of well-being. So this includes happiness, um, laughter and joy, um, but also sadness um, and loss um, and negative thoughts. Um, and feelings of helplessness and hopelessness as well. And you can see that all aspects of those well-being are interlinked. So when we talk about psychosocial well-being, it involves all of those seven aspects. And it's a construct that very much depends upon the culture and the context um, in, in which the emergency has happened to a community and the expression of well-being and what are important aspects of well-being are culturally defined by the community and in some cases by the families within communities as well. And you can see that there is a circle on the outside um, in relation to safety, participation and development. And these are pre three prerequisites. Um, so three areas that must be in place to enable well-being to, to flourish. Um, everybody has a sense of well-being. Um, you can either have a negative sense of well-being um, in relation to sadness or loss or, or physical ill health. Um, and you can also have a positive sense of well-being um, as well. So well-being is a construct that fluctuates um, and it can fluctuate across a day and also across a period of time. Usually people that have um, survived an emergency or are living through an emergency context um, or a situation of adversity, uh, it tends to negatively impact upon their well-being. So they end up with a, a more negative um, aspect towards their psychosocial well-being, which um, many agencies try to measure. 
Um, this well-being flower um, is an adaptation from a paper written by Williamson, John and Robinson um, that was published in 2006. On the right hand side, um, this is a, a graphic which I hope some of you are familiar with as it's taken from the UNICEF Community Based Mental Health and Psychosocial Support for Children and Families um, in Humanitarian Settings. This operational guidance came out in 2018 and you can see that it's called the socio-ecological model. And in the centre of that model, you can see there is the child. And then there are three aspects around the child that actually relate quite closely to the well-being flower on the left hand side. There is a cognitive development. There is the physical development of the child and there is a social, spiritual and emotional development of the child. And all of those aspects are important for a child to have a positive sense of well-being and for them to develop and have a healthy um, developmental pathway and a healthy childhood as well. Around that child in the green circle, you can see that there are family or caregivers. And it is imperative that children have a stable caregiver, whether that's their biological parent or not, um, who is there to accompany them throughout their childhood um, and to be able to guide and ensure that they have a healthy development and also to provide protection for them as well as their basic needs. The primary source of love and attention and caregiving comes from the family, um, whether that's within an emergency context or outside of an emergency context, and particularly for young children, meaning infants, so children um, preschool age, um, so usually between the years of zero to three or zero to four years, the family is their primary lens, it's the glasses that they wear to, to be able to see and access the outside world. The yellow circle represents the community. Um, and in many humanitarian contexts, um, the community is a fundamental support system um, for a child. And uh, you've probably heard the saying that it can take a village to raise and support a child healthily. Um, so the community also includes um, community centres for the child, um, for example, youth clubs or after school clubs or safe spaces or, or um, child activity spaces that you might find in camp contexts. It also includes non-formal education spaces as well as formal schooling, which is fundamentally important um, for a child's educational uh, and cognitive development. Um, the community aspect is often fragmented in humanitarian settings, um, particularly in conflict settings where we tend to see communities pulling themselves um, apart. And community um, also includes um, access to resources within the community for parents and caregivers in relation to the child. So, for example, it can include um, mother and baby groups, um, particularly for young mothers or new mothers who are um, breastfeeding, for example, um, and need encouragement to continue lactating um, to support their child. Um, and it also includes uh, parent teacher associations um, as well around a school. Um, or um, parental or caregiver engagement around an activity space or a youth club. Um, similarly, it could be sports activities like a football club or a, a basketball club. And then the final circle is culture and society. And this is usually the, the broader um, interpretation um, and viewpoint of children um, within that particular context and society. Um, so how childhood is viewed, um, how children is viewed is very context dependent. And it's often enshrined in the laws of the country. Um, so the legal age of a child, for example, what age a person can get married, what age a person can drive a car, um, what age should they become legally responsible. Um, and it also includes um, government policies towards children. So, for example, social security benefits, um, the rules around placing a child with a foster family or an alternative care arrangements. And it also includes infrastructure. Um, so making child, um, making cities child friendly. So, for example, having um, areas where a child can walk and can play safely away from traffic, having uh, designated play areas, um, climbing frames, for example, or play parks um, for children as well, as well as the government investment in its formal um, education and social welfare systems as well. And then you can see that there are two circles around um, on the left and on the right. 
um, of these concentric socio-ecological model. And this is in relation to risk factors and protective factors. So in all cases, from the family and caregiver level out to the community and out to the culture and society, all of those layers, which is a bit like unpeeling a flower um, or taking the shell off an egg or an unpeeling an orange, uh, they they can be both a risk factor. So a family can be the primary source of abuse or can be neglecting a child or can be discriminating against a child. For example, if the child has a mental health condition and the child might be chained or kept at home and hidden from a perceived sense of shame, in which case the family might be trying to protect the child, but is actually a risk factor in that child's life. Um, and similarly, the same for a community. Um, you can get community stigmatization towards a child or ostracization towards a child. Um, for example, children that might have formerly been associated with armed groups. The family and the community may not accept that child coming back um, for a number of years. And similarly, um, those three layers can also be strong protective factors um, as well. And the idea is to, to make those layers as protective as possible for a child right the way through childhood. So from when the child is first born right the way through up until they're 18 and entering into adulthood um, and to minimize the risk factors around the child, whether that's at the family level, the community level or the culture and society and environment around the child. And it's to create equality um, and access um, to services and the support that the child needs to develop in, and healthily um, and to have a healthy childhood. So I've talked a little bit about the term um, MHPSS or mental health and psychosocial support, but what does it actually mean? So the definition um, that's written in the IASC Mental Health and Psychosocial Support and Emergencies Guidelines is twofold. Firstly, it's about protecting and promoting psychosocial well-being and or it's about preventing and treating mental health conditions. It is a composite term that should not be separated. So you can see that on the bottom there is an arrow indicating a spectrum. And on the left hand side of the spectrum, we have what's called positive psychosocial well-being. And that relates very much to the previous slide where I showed you the well-being flower and the socio-ecological model. And everybody has well-being at all stages in their life, whether it's a positive sense or a negative sense of well-being. So positive uh, psychosocial well-being is at one end of the spectrum. As um, situations of adversity happen, um, or as emergencies erupt in a particular country, for example, a natural disaster, civil unrest, um, it can be a, um, a, a technological disaster um, as well, such as a chemical spill, um, and it can also be a full-blown conflict as well. You see that people begin to develop what we call as psychosocial problems or psychological distress, and this is in relation to the emergency that's happened um, so it's it's usually caused by the external um, environment or context in which that person has been found. If this is not um, addressed, uh, either through care and support um, at the family or the community level and at the individual level, then um, that child and their caregiver can go on to develop a common mental health condition. And a common mental health condition includes things like depression. Um, it can also include... Um, things like anxiety, particularly in teenage or adolescent uh, children as well. Um, it can uh, induce feelings of, of strong helplessness and hopelessness that can lead to what's called emotional disorders or emotional related mental health conditions. Um, and it also um, includes children that or, and their caregivers that had these um, conditions before the emergency happened. So some people might have been suffering from depression or might have been suffering from anxiety um, even before the emergency started um, for whatever reason in their life. And they um, may have had an interruption in their treatment and their care um, because of the emergency happening. So, for example, they may not be able to access services. Uh, you can also get children with common mental health conditions that are there from birth. Um, so, for example, a child might be born with an intellectual disability 
um, or a child might go on to develop um, and be diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. Or indeed, a child might also be born with um, Down syndrome or have epilepsy from a very young age. Um, if all of these conditions are not treated, um, or if there has been an extreme amount of trauma and distress directed towards the child um, and their caregiver, then they can develop what's called a severe mental health condition. And this includes things like severe depression or bipolar disorder, where it, um, it usually starts in late adolescent years, where someone can um, have episodes of um, extreme activity or mania and episodes of extreme sadness or depression. It also includes um, epilepsy if it's not well controlled. And it also includes issues um, related to psychosis and schizophrenic uh, disorders. And crucially, in emergency settings, it can also include um, complex trauma related uh, conditions such as post-traumatic stress disorder, which can also happen um, with adolescents as well as with their caregivers. And the severe mental health conditions, again, are something that can appear from birth, um, but they can also be induced or caused by um, a particular emergency or a situation of adversity, um, particularly if a child has suffered from extreme neglect or abuse, whether that's sexual abuse, for example, um, or physical abuse. But it can also be caused, for example, by children that might um, be addicted to um, substances such as drugs or such as alcohol as well. Now, the key thing is that this is a spectrum. So children and their caregivers can move up and down the spectrum um, throughout their life course. Um, and through, uh, they might heal or they might be exposed to another emergency again and slide further along um, towards a common mental health condition or psychological distress. And then they might recover again. Um, so it's a spectrum. So we cannot separate mental health from psychosocial support. Um, it's about accompanying that child, their caregiver and their family through the situations and the conditions in which they find themselves in. Um, there is no cutoff point or threshold where we say this child, this family, this caregiver is not my responsibility. Um, child protection actors have a responsibility irrespective um, of, of the child, the family that's presenting them. Um, to them. And you also have children uh, living with disabilities that can be physical disabilities, um, sometimes in relation to the conflict, for example, due to unexploded ordnance like landmines. Um, and you can also have children with psychosocial disabilities, um, such as mentioned before, like intellectual disability. And children with disabilities, unfortunately, consistently um, struggle to access services, and they consistently struggle to access services provided by humanitarian actors. And the flip side of that is that humanitarian actors are not um, being inclusive enough to children uh, with disabilities and their caregivers. Um, so they are our responsibility. If we are running a um, children's activity space, if we, if we are running a youth club, or a mother and baby group, we need to be able to work with both the mothers and the children that have got a positive sense of psychosocial well-being that are actually managing okay, right the way through the spectrum to children, their caregivers and their families who have also got severe mental health conditions and uh, disabilities as well. So there is no cutoff point and it is not possible to separate mental health and psychosocial support. It is a spectrum and it is everyone's responsibility. You may be familiar uh, with this uh, pyramid. It's called the Intervention Pyramid. It comes from the IASC, Mental Health and Psychosocial Support in Emergency Setting Guidelines. This pyramid is in direct relation to one of the key guiding principles in the guidelines, which is in relation to multi-layered supports. And you can see here that there are four layers on this pyramid. And uh, you have to imagine that the pyramid has 100% at the bottom if you were to draw a line on the vertical axis, the Y axis. So 100% is at the bottom and you would have 0% at the top. So at the very top of the triangle. And at the very bottom, you see that there is a wide base on the pyramid. And this wide base means that 100% of the population should have access to this. And this is the social considerations and basic services and security. This is sometimes called protection mainstreaming. Um, or mainstreaming psychosocial well-being 
um, is often other terminology. Um, GBV actors might know it as GBV mainstreaming. The outcomes are all the same. It is ensuring that basic services provided by any humanitarian actor or any actor in a humanitarian context ensures that the services are safe, they are socially appropriate for the community in which they're claiming to support, and they protect dignity as well. Uh, protection actors usually measure in terms of rights, and psychosocial actors usually measure in terms of psychosocial well-being. But the, the, the approach is exactly the same. So it's about ensuring that your water sanitation hygiene program is safe, socially appropriate, and is protecting the dignity and well-being. It's about ensuring that your food distribution and your non-food item distribution is also safe, socially appropriate and protecting dignity and well-being. So these activities are not commonly done by protection or MHPSS actors, but it is our responsibility to support and advocate for other sectors to ensure that their programs do not do harm and do not cause additional distress to populations that are already struggling. So 100% of an affected population requires that. The next layer up is called strengthening community and family supports. And at this layer is where a lot of child protection um, programming uh, is conducted. And it's about activating social networks. So if you remember back to the well-being flower and back to the socio-ecological model, you're looking very much at the family caregiver layer and at the community layer, which we know is very important. So it's all of the culture, all the traditions, the spaces, the activity spaces, the youth clubs, the after school clubs, the parent teacher associations, your church groups, um, ability to go to the mosque or the temple, uh, your mother and baby group spaces um, as well, uh, that provide this, this physical space where communities can come together, where they can begin to support each other. Um, and where they can talk through their problems, they can um, receive awareness sessions, they can conduct activities themselves, um, they can learn new skills, um, and they can also receive additional emotional um, support, maybe from their peers um, or from another mother or from another father, for example. And it also crucially provides opportunity for social interaction, um, which is so important for a healthy childhood development. About 75% of the population needs that. So in addition to having social considerations of basic services and security, families in emergencies also need to have their family unit strengthened as a family. So family systemic interventions. And you also need to have community supported. And that's critical in emergency contexts where communities tend to be very fragile. The next layer um, it has got a very challenging name. It's called focused or person to person or person to group, non-specialized supports. And this level is for um, people that are at risk of developing um, psychological distress and are, are at risk of developing a common mental health problem or condition, or they already have a common mental health condition, for example, depression or anxiety, and uh, they need to receive additional treatment and support. So at this layer, it includes children with disabilities that might be pre-existing to an emergency or, for example, children that have um, become physically disabled as a result of stepping on a landmine, for example, and need support in adjusting to their new life circumstances again. It includes emotional, practical and psychological support done by community social workers and teachers. And it also includes activities like case management. So for child protection cases, uh, whether that's uh, children associated with armed groups, children in conflict with the law, um, or children in distress, uh, children separated from their families. All of those activities that are done by social workers or case workers are included at that level. And it also includes basic mental health care um, conducted by primary health care doctors and nurses as well. Um, at this level, uh, you will also find support to parents or to caregivers, particularly to parents and caregivers of children with disabilities. Uh, so, for example, support groups or, or peer networks as well. And the important thing is that the activities at this layer are in addition to already strengthening the family unit and community and in addition to ensuring that basic services and security are provided in a safe, dignified and appropriate manner. 
The very top level of the um, intervention pyramid uh, is what's called specialised services, and some agencies call it clinical services. And this is mental health care, um, clinical care by mental health specialists. So psychiatric nurses, psychologists, psychiatrists and psychotherapists. And at this layer, um, you're looking very much at treatment. So treatment of people with more severe mental health conditions. And also it can involve some form of treatment for people with um, disabilities. So, for example, um, epilepsy or intellectual uh, disability as well in children. So that specialised services end of the this intervention pyramid would be at the right end of the spectrum where we talked about severe mental health conditions and disabilities. Um, and again, the positive um, psychosocial well-being is very much dependent upon um, the basic services and security. So that spectrum could also be put alongside this pyramid um, that you can see in front of you. Um, now, the challenge with this pyramid um, is that when we are working in emergency settings, um, it's not so clear cut with these four dividing lines. And I will just go on to demonstrate now. So for healthcare and nutrition actors, they tend to work at these levels. This can be, for example, children with severe acute malnutrition who are in a therapeutic feeding centre, um, for example, in, in uh, drought based emergencies or in malnutrition based emergencies or in emergencies where the conflict has um, impeded or prevented access to, to food or to crops. Um, and it can also include natural disasters where an entire year's worth of crops have been damaged by the natural disaster leading to malnutrition or drought. The mine action and community based protection actors work at this, these layers. Child protection actors work at these layers. And GBV actors work at these layers. So the challenge is that all of these actors need to be able to coordinate and to work together um, because you need to be able to provide support to an individual child who might be a survivor of sexual violence. So it might be related to GBV, but is also a child protection issue and also has um, strong mental health and psychosocial needs. Similarly, you might have a child who has stepped on a landmine that requires rehabilitation services, requires access to health care, requires access to a social worker to help them live with a life, re life readjustment and to help them be reintroduced and go back into the community again. It also requires livelihood support, um, particularly if the child was maybe supporting the family. Um, again, for healthcare and nutrition actors, you can have children with um, severe mental health conditions such as epilepsy who require access to clinical services. And because epilepsy is often stigmatized in many communities where we work, that child might be out of school or that child might be neglected or might be bullied at school or might not be included in the children's activity space in the camp context. So it's also a child protection issue because the child is out of school and they're being bullied and ostracized either by their family or by the community. So the key issue um, is that we need to have coordination across all the sectors because MHPSS sits uncomfortably between all the various sectors and importantly has relevance in every single sector. And this um, graph also shows, sorry, this pyramid also shows that um, referrals need to be made for the child, for the caregivers and for the families across its full spectrum. So from um, referring a family who might be struggling with food, for example, or livelihoods, referring them to see if they can receive an extra food basket or seeing if they could receive an extra NFI distribution. That's a social consideration and basic services and security. That same family might need access to um, meeting other families or engaging in the community. So might need to be accompanied to attend the community centre activities or to encourage the child to go back to school or the child to be involved in non-formal education or an activity space. The parents might need help in managing that child at home, particularly if the child is being disruptive um, or is aggressive. Um, so providing more direct parental support and family support at the household level. Uh, children with disabilities and their caregivers often need support at home 
what we call home based care. And that would also come under the um, strengthening family and community supports, particularly if we are trying to get that family back integrated into the community again. Um, that uh, children um, who are, are having access to the uh, non-food item parcel, the additional food, um, and they might be requiring more home-based care or parents providing um, advice on how they can they can encourage their children to go back to school or manage the aggressive child. If that child um, is proving particularly difficult for the parent or the child might be particularly unhappy and might be developing more serious symptoms um, or more serious problems, then that child um, might need more dedicated support and might value um, being seen by a social worker. So you might have a social worker or a case manager assigned to that family, which should be on that level three intervention. And similarly, if that child has been exposed to extreme trauma, for example, the sexual violence example, um, and is not managing well, um, they might be having flashbacks or they might have um, turned to drug or alcohol um, to, to forget what's happened to them. Or they might be a child formerly associated with armed groups who became addicted um, to a substance, um, for example, um, amphetamine. That child will likely need some form of clinical services and formal mental health specialist support from a psychologist, a psychiatric nurse or a psychiatrist. So the key thing is that the family and the child, similar to the spectrum on the slide before, needs to be able to be moved up and down the intervention pyramid, as we call it. And so this requires referrals and an understanding of what services are available in that particular community. If you remember the community and then the next layer, the society layer on the socio-ecological model. As child protection actors, um, you need to know what's available, not just in child protection, but what's available in health, what's available in mine action, what's available in GBV related services, in camp management, in food, in non-food items as well. Because you need to be able to refer and to accompany children, caregivers and families that require support as they require support that might be more specialised or might um, be more mainstreamed, um, such as accessing basic services and security. So remember the spectrum, positive psychosocial well-being, psychosocial problems or psychological distress, common mental health conditions and severe mental health conditions and disabilities, and your ability to refer and support and accompany a child, a caregiver and a family along that spectrum, and also in relation to this um, pyramid as well. Now, what are the skills and qualities of frontline community-based mental health and psychosocial workers? The key thing is they usually have some form of uh, formal educational or professional qualifications. Um, for example, they can be teachers. Um, they can also be social workers. For example, they might have a bachelor's or a master's degree in social work and then gone on, gone on, sorry, to specialize in social work in the justice system or social work with children or social work with survivors of sexual violence or social work um, with people living with mental health conditions as well. So there's different specialisms within social work. So a professional qualification and an edu professional educational qualification is very important for this work. Um, and preferably that education should be related to children. And that is because it is Im very important that uh, child protection and community based MHPSS workers have a thorough understanding of childhood development. What is healthy childhood development? What happens to a child's brain as they develop? What needs to happen to the context and the environment to stimulate healthy brain development? And this is important because you need to know when that development um, is not happening normally um, and what additional supports might be required to support that child, the caregiver or the family. Um, and also what a child in distress looks like or a child that might have been exposed to extreme distress or trauma. In an emergency, what does it look like? How does it affect their development, their healthy development of their brain um, and also development um, socially as well and as well as emotionally? So there are various professions um, which play a role and can be called frontline community based mental health and psychosocial workers. All of these professions are important. So you have social workers, you have teachers, you have psychologists in some context, you have activity facilitators. You have youth group leaders, you have healthcare workers that includes your nurses, 
your doctors, your psychiatric nurses um, that might have a specialism in working with children. Um, your psychiatrists, again, you have psychiatrists that are child and adolescent psychiatrists that have a specialism in working with people aged under 18 years. Also, nutritionists are key, um, and particularly in emergency contexts, because often nutritionists and nurses are the ones that have most interaction with infant children in addition to their parents. Um, so children in nutritional feeding centers, children suffering from acute malnutrition. And also faith leaders play a very important role um, and or community leaders um, in community based mental health and psychosocial work because they are important in terms of initiation ceremonies in the cultural ceremonies. If you remember back to the well-being flower. Um, so, for example, celebrations, marriages, funerals, um, unhappy times, um, but also being able to accompany and to guide um, a community through a particular difficult period like a conflict or civil unrest. And faith and community leaders are often mentors for many youth uh, and adolescents, um, in addition to teachers as well. So they play an important role um, as a frontline community-based MHPSS worker. And this is my final slide, and I just want to give you um, a small snippets, um, some small drops uh, of resources um, and where you can learn more and you can find out more information. So on the bubble on the uh, bottom left, uh, I've given three websites uh, where you can find uh, more resources. Uh, the first one is mhpss.net. It's a huge interactive network and platform um, with over three and a half thousand members um, that's very community driven and is available in English, French, Arabic and Spanish and also has many resources in multiple languages, for example, in Urdu, in Tamil, um, in Sinhala, in Kiswahili, um, as well as in Portuguese and Italian, for example, in Dari and Farsi. Um, the second one is in relation to uh, the Interagency Standing Committee, a mental health and psychosocial support groups webpage um, within the Secretariat, and also the Child Protection AOR. Um, website, which many of you are already familiar with. Um, you can see that the uh, publications um, on the top uh, are in relation to the original guidelines, uh, 2007. They were released. They're available in multiple languages. And we also have an assessment guide um, or a rapid assessment guide um, that includes three tools, which includes key informant interviews um, with community leaders and faith leaders and teachers, for example. Um, how to sensitively interview people living with a mental health condition in a community and also questions for a focus group discussion um, that you might wish to do with uh, children of different ages, including um, focus group discussions with parents and caregivers as well. Uh, the Continuing on that top row, uh, you also have a very famous book now that's called My Hero Is You that was released uh, this year in March. Um, it's particularly in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and it's particularly um, for children themselves and for families to read at home in their shelter. Um, it's available in over 127 different languages. Um, it's also been adapted into puppet shows, radio dramas, radio plays, in audio books in multiple languages. Um, there's also an animation version, um, and it's available in Braille and in sign language, in multiple different sign languages as well. Um, you will most likely be familiar with the UNICEF guidance on community-based mental health and psychosocial support in humanitarian settings. That came out in 2018, and it's where the socio-ecological model comes from. We also have a referral form and a guidance note um, that tells you how to do the service mapping and um, an example or a template referral form for how you can refer an individual child, a family or uh, caregivers um, for additional services at whatever layer of the intervention pyramid they require those services. And it also tells you how to develop um, a referral network amongst agencies at country level to facilitate these referrals. The last two um, documents, uh, the one on the common monitoring and evaluation framework, we are currently updating. We hope to have an updated version coming out in uh, the end of this year, 
end of 2020. Um, and it gives you a list of indicators and outcomes and uh, goals and impact level indicators to help you measure your mental health and psychosocial support programs in emergency settings. So very much for program planners and for monitoring and evaluation staff within your respective organizations. And lastly, we have something called the Basic Psychosocial Skills Document. Again, this was produced in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. It came out this year. Um, but it's very much for community um, frontline mental health and psychosocial support workers and anybody who interacts with um, the community or with an affected population. Uh, so you can see that there is a wide variety of um, faces and professions uh, on the front cover. So it's uh, meant to be bridging that gap between psychological first aid and what you do if you um, need to support a family or a child or caregivers more long term. So in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic, it started in December, January time and it's continuing now and we're now in September. So psychological first aid is usually a frontline, a first response. But what happens if you need to accompany somebody for longer? and on a daily basis, or you are daily interacting with affected populations. So it's for police, it's for shopkeepers, it's for delivery drivers, it's for nurses, it's for community health workers, it's for border officials, um, uh, it's also for um, teachers um, or youth leaders who are also navigating communities um, and might be active in supporting communities even during lockdown period. So it's by basic psychosocial skills that goes beyond um, psychological first aid as well. Um, and again, we recommend that all frontline community mental health and psychosocial support workers become familiar um, with that guide. And that includes your teachers, your social welfare and your education professions, um, but also your justice professions and also other um, organizations or sectors. Um, particularly working, for example, on uh, camp coordination and camp management um, or in uh, nutrition sector as well, for example. And uh, this was the last slide. Um, so I shall leave you. Thank you very much um, for listening. Um, and I hope um, that you are able to uh, dive in and to, to learn more and to follow the resources. There are many out there. Um, but I hope that we have organized them in a more uh, easy and intuitive um, way as well. Thank you very much for listening and good night.